Hi guys, this is Alicia with Good Morning Sunshine. Um, so today we're on week 7, day 33 um, of vet school. Um, this morning we had four lectures and then we had a lab. Um, so we had nutrition for three of the lectures and then our last lecture we had our immunology um, two lecture. And then we had our necropsy lab, which was fantastic. I was looking forward to that lab, and it was great. Um, but I'm going to start with all the boring lectures. They literally, like, put me to sleep this morning. Nutrition's not my thing. But, I just almost dropped my phone. But, I'm going to tell you all about it. And you'll probably get put to sleep, too. So, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to try to fly through it as fast as I can. Because <laughs> it is pretty boring. So we're going to start with micronutrients. Um, so we have to know what these are classified as. There's different kinds. We have macro minerals. We have micro minerals. We have water soluble vitamins and then fat soluble, soluble vitamins. Um, so the macro minerals include calcium, phosphorus, sodium, chloride, magnesium, potassium, and sulfur. Um, our micro minerals, which are also known as trace minerals, are zinc, copper, um, selenium, iodine, um, iron, um, uh, manganese, manganese, um, moly, denim, and cobalt. And then our water-soluble vitamins include, um, B12, which is <clears throat> copalim, um, folate, which is B9, um, niacin, which is B3, um, Prodoxine, um, which is B6, and then riboflavin, um, which is B2, and thiamine, which is B1. And then we have our fat-soluble vitamins, which are vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin A, and vitamin K. <clears throat> so macro minerals are expressed as grams or milligrams. Um, they are of highest concentrations. And then our micro minerals are expressed as milligrams or micrograms, um, which are our lower concentrations. So we're gonna start with calcium. So what does it do? Um, it serves as an acid and a base, um, but it's a cation, um, so positively charged. So it's a cation plus an acid buffer. Um, it deals with the bone and teeth structure, blood coagulation, um, muscle contraction, and nerve conduction. It serves as a lot of things, but those are our most basic. Um, so, and then what if there's too little of this in an animal's diet, well, they can have milk fever, like in a cow. They can have eclampsia um, in a female dog. Um, they can have tetany or osteopenia. Um, so where is calcium? Well, it's in our bones. It's in our dairy. It's in our dicalcium phosphate. Um, we have calcium carbonate, um, calcium citrate. Um, it's in our greens, also oxalates and um, phytates, and then our legumes like alfalfa, but this also varies across species. Um, and then we have phosphorus. So what does phosphorus do? Well, it's a, it's a, it serves as an acid or base. Um, it's an anion. Um, it's usually used for acidifying. Um, it has a negative charge. Um, its main function is for energy, um, ATP generation, um, and pres preservative in human food. Um, and again, what if there's too little of this in an animal's diet? Well, there's down cow, um, which also presents like milk fever. And then what if there's too much? Um, you can get struvite stones. So those are urinary stones um, or chronic kidney disease, which is CDK. And then where is phosphorus located? Well, it's located in phospholipids. It's located in meat, um, grain, and brands more than it is in forage. Um, the dicalcium phosphate, which is an inorganic source, and then we have phosphates in, pre in our prepackaged human food. So what does complete um, nutrient imbalance mean? Um, it's basically a key ratio. It's a calcium to phosphorus ratio. Um, we want calcium and phosphorus basically to be equal. Um, so our general target is a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, but consequences, if you have less than a one-to-one -one ratio to too little calcium, um, this increases um, PTH, um, which pulls calcium, which therefore yields to pull calcium from bone, which yields osteopenia, um, which is a nutritional secondary um, hyperparathyroidism. 
Um, but what happens if um, you have too much calcium? Well, you get um, calcium-based urolithiasis, and it down-regulates down PTH. Um, so then we have potassium and magnesium. Um, potassium is a cation, positive charge. Um, it's cell cellular action potential and contraction. Um, it's in porridge and fruits and vegetables. Um, it's in potassium citrate, chloride, sulfate, and gluconate. <clears throat> and then we have magnesium. Is it's also a cation, positively charged. Um, it's an enzyme cofactor, thus loss of functions. Uh, <clears throat> it deals with kidney function, grass tetany if there's too little in the diet, um, alkalosis if there's too much in the diet. Um, it's in forage. Um, it's in magnesium oxide, magnesium sulfate. Um, <clears throat> and then you have, if you have excess <clears throat> potassium, it yields um, reduced magnesium absorption. <clears throat> and then we have sodium and chloride. Um, sodium is a cation, positively charged, deals with osmotic balance, <clears throat> salt, um, toxicosis, um, if too much salt, and inadequate water <clears throat> access. So we have sodium chloride, also known as table salt. And then we have chloride, which is acidifying. It's an anion, so negatively charged. It is very usually underappreciated, and it can become low in the blood after vomiting or abomasal obstruction. Um, <clears throat> it comes in various organic forms. Um, it comes in sodium chloride, again, like table salt, and also potassium chloride. Um, so then we have zinc and copper. Um, zinc can negatively affect copper. Um, but what do they do? Um, they're cofactors for several enzymes. Um, they're for the skin and coat um, and for the bone and cartilage. Um, zinc to copper's ratio is usually one to one um, to four to one. Um, but what if there's too little copper in the diet? You can get acromotricia, um, aortic rupture, or poor um, door. But what if there's too much copper in the diet? Well, you can get copper... Um, uh, I'm going to butcher this word. I just know it, so I'm not going to say it. Um, but it's in dogs. Um, and you can also get kidney disease like in sheep. Um, where are they located? Well, they're in um, organ meat. Zinc um, methanine in organic form. Zinc sulfate is an inorganic form. Um, zinc oxide also inorganic form. And then copper sulfate and carbon, copper carbonate and copper oxide. So then we also have iodine and iron. Iron... Iodine um, is thyroid hormones. Um, it iodizes um, sodium chloride and potassium iodine. Um, iron has to do with hemoglobin, um, oxidation of hemoglobin. Um, you can get anemia if there's too little in the diet. Um, it's also in forage and grain and in ferrous sulfate, which is inorganic. And then we have sulfur and molybdenum. Um, sulfur is Acidifying, it's an anion, so negatively charged, is a component of S-containing amino acids, such as methanine, um, cysteine, and cysteine, um, biotin, and thiamine. Um, if there's too much, it degrades thiamine and rumen. Um, and then we have the molybdenum, um, which re reduces availability of other minerals. Um, so what does complete and balanced mean continued? I asked this earlier, but it means lots of interactions, um, calcium to phosphorus um, ratio and zinc to copper ratio, um, and more is not always better. So acid base, um, cations are more alkanizing, so those would be the potassium, the sodium, magnesium, and anions are more acidifying, those would be your chloride, your phosphorus, your sulfur, and your methanine. Um, dietary cation, cation, anion, um, balance, which is also known as um, DCAB or DCAB, um, divided by dietary cation anion difference, which is classified as DCAD, which is DCAD. Um, this is a balance, um, so it's sodium plus potassium minus um, sulfur plus chloride. <clears throat> So functions um, of acid base is for blood pH, urine pH, uh, muscle contraction, and nerve conduction. So then we got into vitamin D. So we're getting to vitamins now. Um, conversion of pro-vitamin D to vitamin D um, in the skin of dogs and cats is inefficient. Um, if you have too little, it yields developmental orthopedic disease. 
If you have too much, um, it yields developmental orthopedic disease as well and soft tissue calcification. So where is the lip? Well, it lives in the liver and kidneys, um, in salmon, which is a fatty fish, in egg yolk and plants, and human supplements. Um, so then we have calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D. Well, vitamin D promotes calcium absorption. If calcium is low or phosphorus is high in the blood, um, PTH is stimulated. Um, calcium is released from bone and phosphorus is excreted in the urine. Um, PTH being parathyroid hormone, um, if you did not know that. Pretty sure that's what it means. Um, and then if calcium is low, it again tells the bone to pull calcium. It also tells kidney um, calcium is low, so it releases vitamin D to the gut. So then we have vitamin E and selenium. Um, vitamin E wants to protect lipids, um, so polyunsaturated, if increased, should also increase um, vitamin E. Um, these are tocopherols. Um, it's a lipid um, antioxidant. It protects, um, again, polyunsaturated um, fats. Um, and then what if there's too little of this in the diet? Well, then you get myopathy or fat necrosis in cats and cows, but it's not very common. And then we have selenium, um, which is an antioxidant. It's important for um, glutathione per peroxidase um, and thyroid hormone production of T4 and T3. Um, but what if there's too little in the diet? Um, you get white muscle disease. Um, it is located in the grain and forage. Um, if Soil is um, selenium rich. Um, then we have fat soluble vitamins. Again, vitamin A it deals with vision, antioxidants, and growth. Um, it deals with retinol and animal, beta carotene, and, and pro vitamin. That's your plant. And, yeah. and then we have vitamin D and vitamin E, which we already talked about. And then we have vitamin K, which has to do with blood clotting. Um, and then our B vitamins, we have B12, which has to do with DNA. Um, what if there's too little on the diet? You'll get GI disease or anemia. Um, where is it at? It's in animal tissue, yeast, gut, and gut micro microbes. And then we have folate, which is B9. It has to do with DNA also. And what if there's too little of this? Um, you get anemia as well. And then we have B3, which has to do with energy metabolism. It is precursor for NADH plus and NADP plus. So this has to do with the Krebs cycle. Um, and then we have B vitamins continued. Um, usually they are sensitive to eat. So this is your B6, uh, which has to do with amino acid uh, metabolism. Um, and it's located in grades and legumes. And then we have B2, which is riboflavin. And then we have thiamine, which is B1. Um, B1 has to do with energy metabolism, the TCA cycle. And where is it? It's in grains and byproducts. Um, and what happens if there's too little in the diet? You have neurologic disease. And then we have cholin and biotin. Um, cholin um, has to do with fatty acid metabolism. It's in fish and egg yolk. Um, and it's choline chloride. Um, biotin has to do with gluconeogenesis and fatty acid metabolism. Has to do with the skin, coat, and hooves. And it's found in um, corn and gut microbes. So sources. Format. We have inorganic uh, or organic. Um, or inorganic is elemental. And then organics are bound to a carbon-containing molecule. Um, amino acid, um, chelated minerals may have increased absorption. Um, phytates and oxalates um, inhibit absorption. Um, diet is whole food supplement um, or dirt and soil. Um, gastrointestinal microorganisms um, are the B vitamins and herbivores and vitamin K. Um, we have parental, which utilizes um, amino acid transporter to get the mineral in. So what do micronutrients look like on an ingredient list? Well, you see all those things? That's what you read on an ingredient list, and those are all your micronutrients. Um, and then can we just do a test um, in order to check patient micronutrient status? No, no single simple effective test is used to determine a patient's micronutrient status. Now, tests are available, but they are very skeptical. Skeptical, those tests being hair tests or blood tests. But not all um, practices, um, not all labs practice um, good quality control with the assays. Okay. So then we have the next nutrition lecture which has to do with pet food. So pet diet includes water, 
and a complete and balanced food with prop proper formulation. Um, this being commercial kibble, which is the most common, commercial canned, commercial fresh, commercial freeze dried or raw, homemade um, cooked or homemade raw, and treats and extras. Um, so then we got into interpreting food labels um, of North America. Um, So a pet food label usually has an AAFCO statement. Um, it tells which, basically it tells um, what species it's for um, in the life stage. So how old, um, so if it's senior or if it's adult or if it's um, kitten or puppy food. Um, also the AAFCO stands for the Association of American Feed Control Officials. Um, it is not a regulatory body. Um, it's a state's department of agriculture or chemist's office may adopt, follow the AAFCO animal feed and pet food guidelines. However, um, they don't put their like stamp of approval on anything. Like I said, they're not a regulatory body. Um, so they have labeling guidelines done. They have ingredient um, definitions. Um, they have nutrient concentration, um, which they have two categories for cats and dogs. So they have adult maintenance, um, growth, and reproduction. Um, they have none for seniors or um, geriatrics, though, per the NRC. Um, so usually on um, food labels, they have the AAFCO statement. So again, it says what species, what life stage, and how the food was meant to be appropriate for this um, species. That includes feeding test or formulations. So I have something that states like animal feeding test used AAFCO procedures um, substantiate. So then the diet name provides complete and balanced nutrition for um, maintenance of adult dogs or cats or growing puppies or kittens and or um, gestating or lactating adult female dogs or cats. So it usually has a statement like that's posted on um, the pet food. So these would be examples right here. And then ingredients. Ingredients are tools to meet energy and nutrient needs. Um, so the AAFCO has their own definition. So meat equals striated, striated skeletal, tongue, diaphragm, heart, esophageal muscle derived from slaughtered animals. Um, for human, This is for human cons um, consumption. And then byproducts equals non-rendered organs. So kidneys, liver, brain, etc. It excludes hair, hoof, horn, and teeth from slaughtered um, for human consumption animals. And then meat meal is rendered, um, fat removed, and it's lighter. So then we have federal food, a drug, and the Cosmic Act of 1938. This is the FFDCA. Um, this is when food and drugs for um, human and animal use, um, they, use they have animal supplements and nutraceuticals. Um, a food equals item consumed for primary, primarily for taste, aroma, or a nutritive value. Um, so no pre-marketing -mar pre uh, monitoring. Um, pet food ingredients are to be generally recognized as safe. So G-R-E-A-S or approved food additives or AAFCO defined ingredient. So then we have the Food Safety Modernization Act of 2011. This is the F FSMA. So it requires food facilities to evaluate the hazards in their operations, implement and monitor effective measures to prevent contamination, and have a plan in place to take any corrective actions that are necessary. Um, for very small businesses are exempt from this. Um, byproducts are protein and amino acids, micronutrients, and they assure pathogens from raw ingredients do not carry through. Um, <clears throat> grains um, are energy for start, like starch. Um, they are amino acids, so gluten equals grain protein. And then micronutrients, um, and then we monitor for um, mysotoxins from the manufacturer. And then we got into marketing um, statements with no regulatory meaning. So biologically appropriate, holistic, premium, gourmet. You hear all these words that are posted on bags of food. But basically for like premium, gourmet, you're just paying more, but it has absolutely no meaning behind it. Um, natural, this has a meaning and definition. Um, 
but uh, we didn't have to memorize this because um, natural means um, so many different things. There's an accurate. So what natural means to us veterinarians is not the natural. Usually when a client comes in and say they want a natural base diet, they usually have like no clue what they're talking about or like their definition is way different from ours. So we always have to ask the client to define what they mean by um, natural. Um, food processing, we have kibble, um, which extrusion is processed. Um, it's heat steamed and mechanical. We have cans, which is retort. Um, it's heat and sterile. Um, heat processing um, eliminates microorganisms and anti-nutritional factors. Um, raw is freeze dried or fresh raw. Um, however, there might be more risk than there are benefits for this. Um, because they might have my um, microbial pathogens. And then we got into pet um, food recalls, which usually is not when animals get sick, but it's where they pull them off the shelf um, for other reasons. Um, yeah, yeah. So then we have the feed ingredient analysis. Um, so near infrared reflectus um, spectroscopy, so NIR, is a fast good uh, way for quick assessment. Um, this you do before offloading ingredients um, at pet food manufacturers. And then we also have a wet chemistry test, which is most preferred. However, it takes longer, um, but it is most preferred. Um, so commercial pet food, how do you choose? There's so many commercial pet pet food options um th there's a lot of resources that you can go to um but again we just provide um you with facts or with our background of knowledge but it's up to you in what you choose to do as um a pet parent um world small animal veterinary association so the wsava nutrition toolbook um tools for pet owners they have the Savvy Cat Dog Owner's Guide to Nutrition on the Internet uh, when selecting a pet food. Um, they have facts and myths. Um, and, they, and they have raw meat-based diets for pets that you can look into. Um, and then the WSAVA, so for selecting a pet food, you want to look for the AAFCO statement label. Um, who formulates um, the diets, is it PhD in nutrition, plus or minus the DACBN or the DECBCN, so employee versus consultant, um, and master's and PhD in food and science technology, um, what is the quality control process, so ingredient acquisition, engineers and manufacturing and line safety, um, nutrient analysis of the finished product, if substantiated by formulation, and testing food and manufacturing facility for pathogens. So then there's also websites you can go to, like the Pet Nutrition Analysis, um, Dare to Ask. Um, you can search for a specific brand and company. Um, they have nutritional experts and nutritional level of randomly um, specified nutrients. And then we get got into treats, uh, which should make up less than 10% of the calories. Because treats are often very bad for a pet and they take away from nutritional value. Um, and then we have nutraceuticals, which are unapproved drugs of low regulatory priority by the FDA. Um, there's no really official definition. Um, typically, dietary supplements intended for health benefits beyond prevention of essential nutrient um, deficiencies. Um, animal supplements are regulated like animal and food and feed by the FDA's. Um, since 1938 by the Federal um, Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act, like I said. And then we got into our third lecture of nutrition today. I was falling asleep at this point. And then she started talking about grass for an hour. So I'm about to talk to you about grass. Um, so, our last lecture of the day, well not, but of nutrition for the day, was on large animal feed. Um, so why do large animals need in their diet ration, or what do they need? They need water, they need forage, fresher process, they need plus or minus concentrates, um, or in plus or minus, oh, and then they need vitamin and minerals, um, so they put this in the forage if they don't have enough. 
Um, what is forage and are there different types? Yes, yeah, so forage um, equals plants that animals eat. You have warm season grasses and then you have warm season legumes. And then you have cool season grasses and cool season legumes. So grasses, in the cold season, you have orchid grass, timothy, tall fescue, or bluegrass. Um, in the warm season, you usually have um, Bermuda grass. And then what is a tall fescue? Well, it has a symbiotic relationship with fungus. Um, it's hardy, it's abundant. Um, Urgo alkaloid from symbiotic fungus, like I just said. Um, broodmares, it has th a thickened placenta. Um, for cattle, uh, it's a summer slump, um, fescue foot. Um, yeah. So they have some with seed, um, with seed heads. And then we have the legumes, which is a symbiotic relationship with bacteria in the roots. It provides nitrogen to this plant, um, beneficial to plants that grow after the legumes are gone. So in the cold season, you have alfalfa and clover. In the warm season, you have kudzu. Um, it replenishes soy nitrogen due to symbiotic root bacteria. Um, Horses may hypersalivate because clovers make them do this um, sometimes. Um, it usually doesn't get too concerning though. And then we have growing season, which varies by the U.S. region and forage type. Um, so again, cool season is spring and fall. So you have two growth phases and then the warm season you have one growth phase, which is in the summer. Again, forage may be fresh or processed. So hay or actual grass laying there. Um, then we have pasture forage, which horses usually lose weight during the winter, um, but gain weight um, during spring and summer and fall. Again, grasses include tall fescue, which is dominant, bluegrass, plus or minus timothy, or and orchid grass, um, legumes, you have clover. So two to three plus acres of three inch average grass height. And it's generally more pal um, palatable than processed forage. So what are ways forage is processed? Um, so hay is dried. It has usually less than 15% of moisture. A moisture is bad. Um, it's usually long stem, chopped, cubed, or pelleted. And then we have haylage, which is fermented. Um, it has 30 to 45% moisture. Air is bad. It's chopped. And then silage is ferment fermented. And it's 63 to 68% moisture. Air is bad. And it's chopped. So hay. It's a grass legume or grass legume mix. Um, so it's cut, sun dried, and then harvested, and then it's baled, chopped, and pelleted. Again, hay moisture is bad, it creates mold or fire. And then we have silage and haylage, which is cut and chopped while moisture is still there. Um, grass or legume includes the corn silage, the grass um, haylage, and alfalfa haylage. It's cut, harvested, chopped, and then put into a silo. Yeah, which deals with anaerobic fermentation. If the chop length is too long or it has too much air, that equals poor fermentation. And then what is good quality forage? Well, it depends on the season, time of day, sunlight, precipitation, temperature, fertilization, forage species, and variety, maturity, so how old a plant is before it's cut or consumed, and the hygiene, if there's low mold or low or no um, mycotoxins. So forage hygiene. Hay can contain mold spores in absence of mycotoxins. Haylage can contain mycotoxins in absence of mold spores. The risk of mycotoxins in haylage and silage on horse health is still being sorted out. Uh, monogastric, so effect of mycotoxins is generally of greater concern than in ruminants. So forage maturity. Um, immature younger plant is higher in calorie. It's higher in quality. It yields um, less um, for biomass. It's higher leaf to stem ratio. However, mature older plant, um, the seed heads indicate that it's more mature. Also, it's of lower quality. However, it yields more biomass, but it has a lower leaf to stem ratio. So when do you cut and graze? It depends on who you're feeding. So you, there's usually a good happy medium though. But smaller plants, um, younger, um, immature plants, um, have, again, have the most calories um, and nutrients. Um, so forage digestibility, um, immature younger plants have higher digestibility, whereas mature older plants have lower digestibility. So again, when do you cut? It depends on who you're feeding. Um, so accessing foraging quality, um, visual, tactile, and olfactory. Look at the leaf to stem ratio, look at the color, look at the smell, look at the presence of debris. 
um, forage nutrient analysis, pasture and process forage, um, sampling method, so clippings of randomly sampled areas of the pasture probe, um, the hay bale or silage. Um, and then we have forage nutrient changes over time. So the cell wall is represented by neutral um, detergent fiber, so NDF, which is the cellulose, the hemicellulose, and lignin. All three of these components are in the cell wall. Um, it is higher as the plant, um, it gets higher as the plant matures, which means low quality forage. Um, the acid detergent fiber, the ADF, equals cellulose and lignin, so two parts of the cell wall. Um, the cell wall, as a proportion, as a proportion of the plant cell increases with maturity, so cell wall is robust. Um, and then we got into forage lab stats for hay. So dry matter in grass hay is 91 to 94, whereas in legume hay it's 90 to 92. Uh, we have the DE, which is um, between 0.8 and 1 in grass hay and 1.1 and 1.3. Um, and then the crude protein is between 7 and 15 in grass hay and 19 and 24 in the legume hay. And the NDF, which is important, um, it's 56 to 70 in grass hay and 34 to 44 in legume hay. And then calcium percentage is lower in grass hay than it is in legume hay. So why does forage quality matter? Well, you don't want your horses or cows getting sick or animals in general from the microbes. Also, concentrates are energy dense, which are relative to forage. Um, they include grain. Commercial concentrates are textured, pellated, extruded. Um, life stage feeds have to do with growth, rep um, reproduction, show, and performance. Um, you complete feeds fiber enhanced, meant to be served without forage. Um, and then grain, you feed too much of this, you can, can, can cause GI upset. Um, this includes proteins and amino acids, starch as for energy, um, but limit this. Um, it includes micronutrients as well. Um, so then vitamins, vitamin minerals, you, have, you can have a block, a tub, a granular, or a balance or pellets when you're adding this to their diets. Um, feed processing are chopped, pelleted, or extrusion. Um, and feeding management, this is not on our exam, but you measure what is a flake, what is a scoop, meal per day, bunk space, and hay fritters. Um, feed management in a pasture, no system, there's rotational grazing um, or strip grazing. So we literally, literally talked about grass for 50 minutes. I literally was going to fall asleep. I'm like, what do we really need to know about grass? But apparently, it's really not that much, but it's just a lot of words. So, then we got into immunology, which did not make things much better. I was still falling asleep. But anyways, <laughs> so we were doing general functions of the immune system. So, antigens and innate Im immunity. We want to start with antigen. So, an antigen or immunogen is any substance that can induce an immune response. So, B-cell or a T-cell immune response. Um, so, antigens can either... An Tegens can either be infectious or non-infectious. Um, infectious um, include the bacterial, the viral, the protozoal, and helminths, whereas the non-infections include self-antigens, food antigens, plant products, dust, um, cell surface proteins, um, synthetic chemicals, venoms, and insect toxins. So the difference between infectious and non-infectious, um, infectious can multiply where um, non-infectious do not multiply. So there's essential features of antigenicity, um, which is the ability to induce an immune response. Um, so one being the size of the antigen, um, large has a strong strength of re immune response. Um, this includes the bacterial toxins, the viral caps, capsids, the protozoal membranes, the hormones, and the venoms. Um, small has a poor strength of immune response, and very small there is no immune response. So the second feature is complexity. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> oh, my sneeze is hurt. Anyways, so complexity. Complex, complex antigens are good antigens. Um, so proteins are good antigens, um, whereas simple s substances are poor antigens. 
um, and this does not induce a strong um, immune response. So example would be a poor liquid. Yeah, they may be big, like I said before, depends on size, but they are simple. So it makes them poor. Um, third, we have stability. Uh, so need to be stable in order to be good. Um, flexible structures are poor antigens. This example would be flagellin. Um, Degradability, um, higher degradable substances are poor antigens and non-degradable are also poor antigens. So examples of this would be still pins and plastic heart um, valve implants. And then foreignness, foreign antigen, so non-self evoke a strong immune response. This would be a dog antigen um, foreign to a horse, the strong immune response. Um, self antigens in normal individuals do not induce an immune response. And then a characteristic feature of the normal um, immune foreign, non-self, but um, not to self antigens. So then we have antigen antibody interactions are specific. Um, antigen concentration influence immune response or tolerance. So low yields T cells that affect are unresponsive, so yields tolerance, whereas moderate um, yields an immune response, and then excessive um, yields T and B cells unresponsive, which also leads to tolerance. Um, so moderate is best for immune system um, for the immune system to respond. Um, antigen antibody binding is highly specific. Uh, any changes in shape or chemical structure of an antigen will prevent binding of antibody to an antigen. Um, so virus keeps changing. Um, so viruses in general, you know, kind of like COVID or the flu virus, are constantly changing because they're in competition with our immune system. Um, so it, antibody binds to the antigen. So antigen also known as epitope and then we have the antibody cannot bind to the new shape of the antigen that's when uh, like the virus changes its shape um, antigenic determinants or epitopes is a single large molecule such as a protein that can be shown to induce multiple immune responses um, large molecules have regions against which immune responses are directed these regions are called the antigenic um, determinant or an epitope um, and each can have their own um, immune response. Then we have a haptin, which is a small molecule less than a thousand Daltons, that by itself um, cannot induce an immune response. However, when bound to proteins, it can provoke a strong immune response. So a small molecule like a haptin um, yields no immune response. However, when um, it binds to its carrier or protein, there can be an immune response. Um, so binding of small molecule happen to a large molecule like a protein induces immune response to a haptin. Um, so then we went into cross-reactive epitopes or antigenic determinants. Uh, a common epitope found on diverse antigens. Um, cross-reactive epitopes can occur between um, two different organisms or between microbes and mammalian cell tissue. Um, so immune responses are antigen driven. So an antigen yields an immune response. If there's no antigen, there's no immune response. Um, so then we got into, we're going to get into the innate immunity now. Um, so there's um, three lines of defense. There's a first line, a second line, and a third line. Um, we're going to start with the first line of defense. Um, that includes um, two barriers. You have the physical barrier, barrier and the chemical barrier. The physical barrier includes skin, the GI system, respiratory, oral, gentle, and mammary gland. And the chemical barrier includes um, lysosomes, um, complement C, lysines, um, chemokins, opsonins, and acute phase proteins. Um, so we're going to start with the external surface of the skin. How skin protects from invasion of the antigen? Well, sebum from the sebaceous glands, low pH. We have a natural um, desquamation. Um, skin is occupied by non-pathogenic um, bacteria, therefore not allowing pathogen to adhere to the skin. So disruption of skin integrity, so after burns and recision, will allow um, pathogens to enter the body more easily. And then we have the internal body surface, which is the GI tract. So we have the mouth, which includes um, saliva, which yields a flushing action. And then we have the stomach and intestines, which are of low pH. Um, lysozyme um, produce this enzyme. It kills a lot of bacteria. Um, normal bacterial flora secrete um, acids, aid in digestion, compete for space, and regulate health and disease. 
Um, and then we have the urogenital tract. Um, so urine is a natural flushing action. Um, it yields a low pH. And then we have the vagina, which is um, epithelial rich in glycogen and promotes the growth of lactobacillus, which yields lactic acids. And then we have the respiratory tract, which is suspended particles cleared by turbulence. Um, walls of the upper respiratory tract has mucus, um, alveolar macrophages, and ciliary action of the respiratory tract, um, yield of fl flushing action, and yield um, lactenins, um, which make which is has the ability to bind to proteins, so it, so it makes sure antigens don't attach. So the first line of defense and immunity, we're going to need to complement C now. Um, complement consists of a complex series of proteins, many of which are enzymes, so proteases. Um, they can bind to an antibody molecule or can act independently to affect various aspects of the immune system. Um, complement consists of about 30 proteins, which are designated numeric, um, numerically with a prefix C, which stands for complement. So, for example, with C1 to C9, um, C3 and C5 are very important in inflammation and eliminating antigen. Um, complement components are produced by um, the liver, macrophages, um, monocytes, GI and urinary tracts, neutrophils um, store large quantities of some of the complement components. Um, many functions of the complement, we have complement mediated um, chemotaxis, specific, um, Scott. So then we have specific C components, which attract um, phagocytic cells to the site of the antigenic assault. Um, C5 attracts all types of phagocytic cells, um, such as neutrophils, um, esophils, macrophages, and basophils. Um, it stimulates respiratory burst of neutrophils. Um, Complement media opsonization, which means phagocytes have receptors for C components. Um, phagocytosis, phagocytic cells have um, complement receptors. So then we have complement uh, mediated inflammation. Um, and we want to go more into this tomorrow, so don't worry if you don't understand what I'm talking about. We're going to get, he said we'll get more into it tomorrow. Um, when we talk about anaphylaxitoxin. Yeah, I don't know. But that was all we had today, and then we had our lab, which was pretty awesome. I wish we could take pictures, because it was pretty cool. Um, but we cannot, unfortunately. Um, tomorrow I'll be sticking my hand up a cow's butt. So... Not looking forward to tomorrow. I'll let you know how that goes. I am completely terrified. I might cry. I might throw up. I might do both. So this was the one lab I didn't want to do. And here we are. And it's so early. But anyways. Um, I love you guys. I know it was boring. Um, sitting through it was even boringer. Um, but we made it through. So here we are. Um, so I'm going to work on some more work like usual. Um, and I will talk to you guys tomorrow and let you know how the lab goes.